In terms of genealogy education, we often don't know what we don't know. Our guest today is going to give us lots of suggestions to help us figure that out. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head to Pennsylvania to talk to genealogist Elisa Scalise Powell. Elisa is a certified genealogist and the co-director of GRIP, the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. She is also a former president of the Board for Certification of Genealogists and former director of the Association of Professional Genealogists. Elisa, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Thank you, Marianne. It's great to be here. I would like to get started right out of the gate talking about your certification, because the thing that strikes me so much about your certification is that you got certified in 1995. A certification goes a really long time ago. Do you know what number you were? 7-Eleven or something oh, like that. Oh, I could wow. look it up <laughs> on the BCG website. It's there. Okay. I was thinking you must have been one of the really early numbers just because it seems like so long ago to me. Tell us about this time period and how much experience you had with genealogy at this point and what was the motivation for becoming a certified genealogist? 1995, I was a young mother at home. I had been. That's what kind of got me kicked into genealogy to start with is I wanted to be at home with my kids, but also be mentally stimulated. So I jumped into genealogy, and that was about 1986 that I was doing just the starting point. We moved to Pennsylvania from Massachusetts in 1990, and that's when I was really able to dive in to the family history research because this is where we're from, is uh, southwest Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. I grew up in Erie. And our families were from here, Ohio and uh, West Virginia. So down, being down in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania was really advantageous for access to records and knowledge. My mentor here in Pittsburgh was a woman named Helen Harris, and she was certified. And she had founded the Western Pennsylvania Genealogical Society, which I immediately joined. She took me under her wing. She would play Legos with my children on her floor of her home office while I fixed her computer and taught her how to do computers. She mentored me in genealogy and she says, you should be certified. And I said, okay. And that was how I became certified. <laughs> you just need somebody to give you that push. And I might an mention at this point that uh, I added the CGL, the Certified Genealogical Lecturer, on as the additional credential when Tom Jones says, uh, it's just a matter of packaging, just uh, just do it. So I did it. At this time period, 1995, this is really early on. This is before mailing lists really, I mean, there might've been some lists, but before widespread APG list and, you know, certainly before Facebook and all this kind of stuff. Where was the impetus coming from for getting certified? Was it from national conferences? Is that where the meeting of the minds was, where all the the expert genealogists got together? And I did not attend my first national conference till 1997 in Baltimore. No, 1995, it was totally Helen. And she was certified. Uh, she's been deceased now um, many years. But I later found out she was also a, a judge uh, evaluator of portfolios. So she knew her stuff. It was that friendship, that mentoring, unofficial mentoring. It, it was more the friendship. She did the newsletter for the Western Pennsylvania Genealogy Society. So I was helping her do formatting and do all that. Besides encouraging you to become a CG, did she lure you into the society to take on roles there? Well, that and my natural enthusiasm for volunteerism. <laughs> you know, you lift my bangs and it says, you know, uh, can't say no or something under there. 
So, yes, uh, I was president of WPGS in 1997-98, I believe it was. Uh, they only do one-year terms, so that was uh, my year for uh, being president of the regional society here. When I arrived in Pittsburgh in 1990, I helped to revitalize my local society that meets at the uh, public library, and that's the North Hills Genealogists of Pittsburgh. And uh, by revitalizing them, I became their charter president of the reorganized group. The group I found when I moved back to Pennsylvania was about six people, and we grew it to 160 within a year, and now we're up to almost uh, 300 members. So wow. I have been at every single meeting, board, and program meeting in the past 30 years for the North Hills Genealogists. So yeah, my volunteerism seems to just occur naturally. <laughs> Wow, you're a very dedicated genealogist, even even with the small kids. Did you bring the kids to those meetings, or did you leave them at home? They were left at home, uh, and I like to tell the story in my classes I teach on uh, transitioning to be a professional genealogist. I tell the story of one night I was uh, bathing my son, my young son, and he says, oh, where's Daddy? And uh, I said, oh, Daddy's at a meeting. And he shakes his little head, and he says, oh, no. Only mommies go to meetings. <laughs> That's very cute. Well, that was his experience, that mommy yeah. always went to meetings. and Daddy would put them to bed, but this was an unusual evening. As you are with your, your mentor and you're deciding to become a certified genealogist, at what point do you think about starting a business and doing research for pay for other people? That actually occurred earlier, Marion, when I moved back in 1990 and was had access to more records and was able to do my family history. I started, of course, reaching out to more cousins who said, oh, while you're at the courthouse, would you mind looking up my other side of the family that we're not related together on? I said, well, I need to charge you gas money, which, of course, was much cheaper back then. That was the start of the business in actuality, because then I had to do a re reports for them, tell them what I found, and kind of stumbled my way. That's without you know YouTube and without really connecting into a professional grouping other than uh, Helen, and there was a couple of other professional genealogists in the WPGS uh, society. You just uh, stumbled along and uh, you know did some self-reading maybe. Books was important to read. Uh, the Genealogical Helper was uh, the main magazine at the time, and that only came out every other month. Societies and their educational programs, as far as records and et cetera, were very important. Yeah, the whole face of, of genealogical education was different at that time, because this was really still the time of the self-educated genealogist, for the most part, other than conferences and society meetings, right? Right. That was it. As you just read books. There wasn't any online to read. Yeah. So as far as my education, it was just experience. Experience is what I honed over, um, you know, the first four years of uh, total dedication to family history and then the following five, four or five years of client work. I used to be able to judge if somebody was ready, uh, somebody who's fresh out of the gate, a, a novice uh, who's just found genealogy, and they say, I want to become certified or I want to become professional. And I ask them, well, how much time do you dedicate to that? How much time do you, do you spend every day or once a week or once a month? How much time can you devote to that? education and experience, diving into the records and analyzing them and writing reports and all that. And from that, I can t say that it used to be, if you had seven years experience, uh, you would be more successful in your application to become certified. I think we can shrink that a little bit nowadays because we do have institutes and uh, conferences and online educational classes. You can speed that up a little bit more so that maybe you could be ready in, for certification in three or four years, five years maybe. Again, it depends on how much time per each of those years. Five years of doing genealogy is not the same as five years of doing it correctly. Yeah, I always smile when, when people say, oh, I've been doing genealogy for 30 years, because I think it's the most meaningless phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody could be doing that. They could be doing it, you know, like you said, once a week, once a month, twice a year. Yeah, 30 years. Or they could be doing it wrong just never learned or, you know, whatever. So that's a 
tough gauge. We don't have any gauge in genealogy about first grade, second grade, uh, baby genealogist, uh, high school genealogist, college genealogist, you know, whatever. Well, how do you rate yourself? And there was a study done. Tom Jones did it with, I believe, Angela McGee. Tom's son is a statistician. So they actually studied this phenomena of self-identification and people always overestimate where they are on the genealogy scale from beginner to professional because you don't know what you don't know so you cannot see the end of the yardstick because you have not gotten there yet. What do you think is the best way for a genealogist to figure out what they don't know? Challenge yourself with reading other people's works. I would say, you know, the NGS quarterly uh, New England Historic Genealogical Register, uh, those kinds of works. I was always intimidated by them, to tell you the truth, until the day I read something. And I said, I could have written that. And I then the light bulb went on and said, wow, you're ready. You're, you're, you've progressed. You've, you're, you know, you've learned something here. So one of the interesting things about you and your career is that while you're a working professional doing research and things like that, you're also very meta, so to speak, in that you're very synonymous with teaching professionals how to be professionals with the, the various things that you have done. Being president of BCG, the Board for Certification of Genealogists, you've been a director. At, at what point did this become important to you? Well, I found my lo- that I like to teach about 1993 when another member of the Western Pennsylvania Genealogy Society asked me to take over her community college class that she had been teaching because she needed to go to Australia with her husband on a trip. And oh my, she couldn't pass that up. So she asked me to teach her four week class. And I was kind of in a panic or whatever. Uh, You know, what do I teach? And um, so it was like us starting how to start. And I did that. And so then I said the next semester, do you want your class back? And she said, oh, no, you can have it. So I ended up teaching for 14 years at the community college, the beginning genealogy. And as computers came along, I taught a separate class on computers and genealogy because it used to be a separate topic. Just as DNA has been a separate topic to genealogy and it's starting to come together and converge into just genealogy, another piece of evidence. Computers at that time were seen as separate, and technology lectures were separate, but now we you can't do genealogy without touching a computer. So those things have already converged. But back in the 90s then, I just enjoyed that education. And then as I, my professional knowledge grew, I love to share it. I mean, it's just a, a sharing. And I've always been involved in APG. I was, as you mentioned, director for six years. I won their Professional Achievement Award in 2017, and I thank them for that recognition. Being an APG director for those six years, which is the maximum term, I uh, rubbed elbows with a lot of professionals. I believe in the mission of APG. I believe in bringing the next generation up the right way. I believe that we all are going to age out and Who is there to replace us? Who's going to carry on the work we have dedicated ourselves to? We have spent our lives, all of us who are in it now, trying to upgrade the field of genealogy. And we need to have the assurance that the next generation of genealogists, no matter what their physical age is, but the next generation of genealogists will carry that work on and continue to upgrade, uphold and create a better world through genealogy. One of my philosophies is we're all in this world to be helpful to each other. And the arena that we have picked here is genealogy. Now you can pick a different arena. I I used to show dogs and uh, that was uh, a nice arena to be in and be helpful in also. But then uh, I had to, you know, decide on how, where you devote your time. Uh, Genealogy went out this, this lifetime. (laughs) Let's go back to when you first started your business. You had mentioned that you were taking clients for your cousins and stuff like that. When you became a business, what sort of business did you become? Uh, Were you a sole proprietor? Did you become an LLC? Did you formalize your business at the start or when did that happen? 
it's a sole proprietorship. I talked with many of our colleagues at that time. And the only people doing LLCs uh, back then uh, was somebody like Marie Melchiori, who's now retired. But she was doing artifact research, mostly for military items. And her residence in the Washington, D.C. area gave her access to the National Archives. And she had a clientele of uh, antique dealers. Because we all know that a thing with a story is worth more money. And if you get the story wrong as a genealogist when you're doing that research, you can be sued because it involves money. So uh, she protected herself with an LLC. And I didn't figure I needed that kind of protection. Uh, my cousins weren't going to sue me or something over wrong research. Nowadays, however, I would advise any transitional genealogist to consider that, especially if you're getting into DNA adoption research, anything where there's money or a danger of getting it wrong, causing real grief in someone's life. Mm -hmm. So I would advise uh, looking into that at least uh, for your own comfort and safety. Yeah, maybe air research and uh, forensic genealogy as well. Absolutely. Anything with living people. So give us an idea of what your services were for your business and how many hours did you work? Were you, you, you were a mom, so are you working part-time at the beginning and then as the kids became older, you became full-time or, you know, what did it look like? What did your business look like? I did research for others, and I remember back then I could only work four hours a day, which was basically by the time you get the kids on the bus till the time their first one's home again. So what's that, half time or something? But in that four hours, you also have to do your advertising, your marketing, your filing, your answering uh, letters. And then I remember hire, having to hire babysitters or my husband in the computer industry, he was one of the early ones that was able to work from home. So when the kids got into junior high, high school age range, he was at home. So I could go out to research courthouses a little further afield than just my own county. My mother-in-law, when the kids were still much younger, was our babysitter. And she would come and babysit, and she never understood what I did. And <laughs> I was not legitimate in her eyes until the day I pointed to our counter. Everybody has a, a place in their home where the mail lands, right? So I pointed to this counter where the mail landed, and I said, Mom, in that stack is $500 I haven't had a chance to deposit yet in checks due to my business. And then she realized that I was contributing to the household income, that I, that I did have a legitimate business, that my running off was not abandoning my children. And her support was extremely important because that allowed me to do the American dream here and have a better life for my family in my arena, which was genealogy, you know, while my husband also worked. And I must say, I've uh, since he has always worked, uh, my health insurance has always been through his company. So uh, that has been freeing in that sense that I don't have to uh, support myself uh, for the health insurance. But I was able to pay for the college, all the college expenses once they got there. That came out of genealogy money. There was the summer that he was laid off from his uh, computer job in the downturns around uh, 2007 or so. 2008, one summer, uh, we supported a family of the four of us and a boarder. So uh, the whole family was on genealogy through the summer. And then he was able to get back to work in the fall and uh, they would ship the, everybody out to their colleges or wherever they were going. Genealogy has always been there for me as far as the research business. And it's, I think, very adaptable that you can adapt it to what you need in my Talking to uh, transitionals, uh, sometimes if you have that secondary income and you're doing this just to take the grandkids on vacation or to send the kids to college or you have a special project in mind, uh, you want to add an addition onto your home or something, some special project, you can do that and set aside that money at, you know, by earning it through genealogy. As a continuous business, as a full-time business, uh, we have had many people depending on their expenses, actually sustain themselves on uh, genealogy. Clue there is to branch out and do many different things. Research will sustain you. And I'm hearing now from some of my peers and colleagues how they want to pull back 
from genealogical speaking because it takes too much time that they could devote to other things such as client research or such as publishing something that uh, a major book or or something that uh, would bring in more money than speaking to societies and traveling and creating new lectures, et cetera. So uh, that's an interesting trend that I'm starting to see. And of course, those who are eager to start their careers can pick up that slack by filling in the holes that veterans are not willing to travel for uh, because they have moved on to other gigs, other types of income, passive and aggressive income. So uh, there's a lot of changing cogs in this wheel that we call the genealogy field. And I'm always happy and eager to help the uh, younger generation come up through the ranks. When I started as a professional, I remember in that self-same genealogy society, WPGS, one of the veteran researchers there slamming down her fist on a table saying, what do you know about genealogy? And when she learned that I was wanted to be a professional. And I thought that was very negative, but it did not deter me. Why did she say that? Jealousy is always a reason that people, some people give, realizing that, thinking that I was going to take from her clients or something. We have to work in a model of abundance. There is mm -hmm. enough for all of us. I agree. There really is. I could be overloaded here with genealogy research clients. A lot of people came through Pittsburgh. I understand not all your listeners are in a uh, geographic location that that's uh, true, but there is enough out there. There's enough ability to pivot and uh, select different uh, niches that you can do a certain specialty maybe in your area. But I think it was partially that. And I, I remember the same, same genealogist. She um, worked for an air search firm, which looks different a little bit than we do nowadays. They would hire you, so to speak, to but on, only pay you if they were able to reach out to all the heirs and have them sign for that uh, missing inheritance. So she earned enough on one case to pay off the mortgage on her house. And I do remember that as a, a story. So maybe she was thinking I was going to grab some of that uh, income from, from her. And she was a single woman, older, of course. Now, older is relative. She was probably 60. I was 30. Uh, so, you know, oh, you were a whippersnapper. <laughs> I was, I was. And, uh, yeah, age difference, that discrimination. I understand some of the under 50 genealogists now are uh, still experiencing some of that. And it saddens me because I experienced it, you know, 30 some years ago that we, sh again, shouldn't discourage the younger generation, no matter your physical age. I mean, you could be 80 just entering in here as a uh, new transitional uh, genealogist. So I'm not speaking to physical age, but uh, the new generation of genealogists, we need your support. We need you to come in, learn all you can from the elders. Be respectful. Uh, that's one thing maybe I could say is the elders have paid the dues and all that. And some, not all, and certainly not your listeners, want to jump into that specialty, jump into the $150 an hour or whatever it is, some, but haven't put in the dues to learn, experience, get into the records, take the classes, build the network, and do all that that is necessary to build that business. So jumping too fast will earn you disrespect from your local peers and elders. And when you hope to earn respect and gain their mentorship. Now, I will say I have mentored several people in my area, and some have been very successful, and some have said, well, I'm, this isn't for me, and just kind of dropped off the radar. And that's fine, too. But those who have grown and gained, they didn't see the potential in themselves until that mentor came along. Just as my mentor, Helen, saw the potential in me and nurtured me along until I was able to take off on my own. Let me ask you, I know a lot of our listeners are thinking right now, this whole mentor thing sounds really great, but how do I get one? How do you? That's the point. You don't get one. They get you. All right. So how do they get you? Make yourself visible. Make yourself helpful. 
make yourself volunteer with that. I, I can't say no under your bangs. Uh, <laughs> they need your help as much as you need their guidance and wisdom. So get involved. Uh, get involved. Get involved. Get involved. Yeah, get involved with your society. Get involved with APG. Get involved with a national thing. Get involved with an event, a conference, or whatever is in your area. Amount of time that you can volunteer. Getting to know people, networking with them, lets them get to know you, lets them get to know your talents. Different organizations try to keep a talent pool of their members so that when an opportunity comes up, they will say, oh, who were we talking to that is good at marketing? Who were we talking about that really is good at project organization? And they may contact you in those respects. And then you work with a committee and the committee gets to know you and you do this project and you're successful and all boats rise when we are all successful like that. What we have found in various organizations is when you try to assign a mentor, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work because a mentorship is a relationship. It's a relationship between two people who hit it off, who respect each other and who have a mutual goal. There was a Canadian genealogist who tried mentorship. Um, he's a mile long past, but I still have some of his emails where he would actually have these um, mentees come into his home and he'd give them assignments. Uh, go out to the courthouse, go out to the library and do this research. Bring your research report back to me and I will help you understand how you can make it better. And I uh, thought that was wonderful for him to be able to do that, to have that kind of time. It sounds, sounds more like coaching or a more, a more formal education process than mentoring without being a full-blown education program. Yeah, he, that was late 90s, so it's what we had back then. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about some speakers are moving away from wanting to speak as much. How much do you think that the state of media today is impacting that in that genealogists now at their fingertips have the opportunity to become a YouTuber or a podcaster or to host their own online webinars, or they can be hired to provide webinars, you know, by societies or companies. How do you think that's impacting what you were describing? I think it is affecting genealogists who are willing to go out to speak because if you're doing, a, say, a all-day seminar on a Saturday, you have to go out Friday uh, and you can't maybe get home till Sunday. So that's uh, 48 hours maybe that you're devoting, whereas if you're doing it through an internet media kind of web, webinar or podcast thing uh, mechanism, you're just sitting at home. You have no travel time involved the toll on genealogical lecturers to come up with new topics. There are really only so many topics in the world. So you put your new twist, you put your own twist on an old topic. You, do, you, you take your old material and update it and change it and add and subtract. You're getting paid, what, $100 on a webinar, $150? That's another uh, sticking point is that people think webinars are cheaper because we don't, you don't have as much invested. No, you have just as much invested in the time you've put into that webinar. If I were sitting in front of you uh, physically or through the internet, I have just as much invested in that delivery of content and sometimes more because now I got to uh, learn the delivery system. How do I tweak my physical presentation for an online audience? That takes time. I just wrote an article for the APG e-news on how to do that, how what it takes to become an online speaker. So it does take a little bit of a different approach. It's totally different. You're, you're speaking to an empty room. You get no a feedback of the faces or the energy. It's uh, just a totally different experience. And some people can do that and some cannot. And some fall flat. Their voice falls flat. They aren't animated. Uh, you have to animate your, your audience through your voice because that's all they got on the webinar. Uh, that and maybe some slides. Podcasts, uh, same. You know, you don't even have the slides on the podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> I love audio. <laughs> <laughs> 
Another thing I want to touch on is going back to your research services and and you were saying, you know, over time you were making more money and you were showing you were contributing to the family. I think one of the most difficult things for genealogists as they're transitioning is that discipline. How did you discipline yourself to do your research projects in a timely manner, to stay focused on point to what the client asked and and then deliver the product that they were expecting? Well, that's a great question, Mary. And how to stay focused? I only had the window from kids out the door to the bus to the kids back in the door to the bus. So you say to yourself, I got to stay focused and uh, maximize this time. As they grew older and as my knowledge grew, maybe do start writing the research report as you go. That's also one of the things that Tom Jones recognized that uh, he asked me to do for his writing course at IGHR in 2008, I believe it was, a writing as you go lecture. And that's where that started. It's my phraseology, because it's the title of my lecture, but it's an older concept based on standards again. So as I learned more about standards and they became codified in the standards manual, you can go there and see the standards for research reports. And it's very much the right as you go. Now, the twist on right as you go is to start with a template and fill in what you know before you even reach for the first record. Fill in what you know, the goal and all that. So what what does this template look like, roughly speaking? uh, it looks like oh, it's got the, the, a header with your own name because you got your professional business. And I always had a, a letterhead for my business. It's evolved a little bit over the years, but I always have the same type of letterhead and same logo. And then you have who the report is to. You have the date. You have your goal. You have what you know. You have the places you went or want to go to as far as repositories. When online came in, repositories are also online places like Ancestry and Family Search, etc. And then you have your notes, and that's the body of the report is your research notes, right? And then you have a conclusion and a bibliography and an eye tech on the actual images at the end of the report. So that's the Cook's tour of that, which you again can find in the standards manual. That these elements are laid out there, but they beauty of the right as you go method is how do you use these elements people are so tempted to jump online and just start researching and then i'll write the report later or in our old mindset when we were out to courthouses when i went out to that courthouse i'd come back and i'd have to make dinner or do homework with the children how do you write it up later and now you've forgotten some of it Well, if you can write as you go, if you can, uh, nowadays you can take a laptop or a tablet or something to the the courthouse and write notes or write into that template right away, it is much more efficient to do it that way. So what happens if you discover, you you find a record and it provides you with uh, certain information, you write it in your report because you're writing as you go, and then you find another record that kind of contradicts that first information do you you revise what do you, how do you approach the the report with that well the report as i'm writing it is gathering the information i analyze it later so that i can weigh these evidence okay the death date i found in the cemetery book that a nice society read the tombstones that's where i got that and you cite that Then later on, you find the death record online somewhere, and it gives a different death date, and you cite that. Now, then you start to bring in your knowledge of how to weigh evidence and say, gee, the death record for a death date should be pretty good, should be. We all know examples of when they aren't. The book that was transcribed from a tombstone has many chances of being wrong because it is a derivative source from the tombstone. It The tombstone itself could be wrong because it's not carved in stone on the day the guy died and maybe has been eroded and has been misread or mistyped into the book. So 
you have a lot more chances of that being a lesser reliable source than, say, the death certificate, not saying the death certificate is absolutely correct. So you start to weigh out that evidence and you leave the recording in that you found this death date because you show your thoroughness uh, in that. And then your conclusion is he died on this date and you cite the death certificate and not the other date. And then you can explain your reasoning. Part of the write as you go method also is putting your research plan into the future suggestions or future recommendation section. And that's uh, where you put the research plan. And then as you can do each one, you bring that up to your research notes and execute it. So wonder if you find something that changes your whole plan. Oh, my gosh. He wasn't born in Allegheny County. He was born in Erie County, Pennsylvania. So you, you got to change your whole research report uh, plan. And you throw out everything else. You revise. That's the one section that I would throw the um, the old uh, research plan out because it's no longer relevant in any manner and develop that new research plan and then continue on. But the client had told you Allegheny County, so you have to address that. And you have to say, gee, he wasn't born in Allegheny County. What were you thinking? <laughs> you know? It was Erie County is where I found them. And this is why I think it's there. And that's why this same man with the same name or a different man, same name problem that's uh, where he is. That's where your guy is, not where you thought he was. So that's uh, the method on how it is efficient because you, it's a living document. You go back and forth and you talk to yourself on this document, it's citing sources as you find them. And the first thing you do, I remember at the family history library, I walked up to Tom Jones and uh, we had this conversation. I said, well, what's the first thing you do? He says, I, before he opened the microfilm box, he wrote down, what it said on the outside of the box before he would get into the microfilm itself. You note all the citation things on the first frame of the, of the film. If you can discipline yourself to not get ahead of yourself, it actually saves you time because then you don't have to go back and find that source again, try to remember the citation, etc. I will say one of the, biggest mistakes of my early career was thinking I would remember. Mm. I will remember where I got that. I will remember that it was the red book and not the blue book. I will remember it was, you know, that, that doesn't happen. Well, and luckily now we have phones so we can take pictures of the, the microfilm or the front of the book <laughs> or the yeah. title page and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's uh, very helpful. Alyssa, what was one of the hardest things about uh, running your business? What was something you weren't particularly good at that you had to improve? Believe it or not, I'm not great at time management. Because I am a, a yes, I'll do that kind of person, I had to learn how to say no. That was very the hardest thing because it's not in my heart to say no. I've taught my children also that, you know, if it's possible, if it doesn't hurt anyone, we can do it. I have to realize that, yeah, it, it may be possible. Uh, it doesn't hurt anyone, and uh, but I can't do it because I just don't have enough time in the day. People are talking nowadays about all this uh, free time they're having. I don't see it. You know, if I didn't have my genealogy business, I'd have uh, my personal genealogy. I'd have uh, house cleaning projects. I'd have <laughs> all kinds of projects here. What about? The whole idea of pivoting and going to conferences and hearing something unexpected and and then maybe it takes you in a new direction. Can you talk to me about that a little bit? Sometimes somebody says something, and this is where at the APG, if you're transitioning to be a professional genealogist, then join the APG. Go to their conferences, attend their uh, online webinars. They have knowledge that is unique to professional genealogists that they are willing to share, and their mission is to educate. I always enjoy the in-person APG conferences when I can get there because it's wonderful to hear the projects that everyone else is working on, something you might not have thought of. I have had conversations, and I like to ask people, what are you working on? So I was, learned of a company that was doing books and they needed some uh, book done on Pittsburgh, uh, you know, the research uh, things in Pittsburgh. So uh, I 
have done that quick sheet kind of format, that laminated sheet on Pennsylvania resources. Uh, and then I uh, did the book and then they stopped publishing before it could get actually published. But but I learned that that at a conference and that took me in a different direction, a different, hopefully revenue stream that I uh, would try. And I learned a lot from that project. So I'm, I'm not going to say too much more, but uh, it's always a learning experience. Uh, so, so you think it's you a can... good thing? You think it's a good thing to pivot and to... To try different things, to see what you're uh, suited for, to grow yourself. Unless you're really happy just doing, doing, doing what you're doing, 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 that's fine. I mean, that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm talking about maybe being uh, a little bit diverse so that when the world changes around you, how will you react? How uh, Do you have other income sources? Do you have other avenues? Do you have other networking buddies to rely on? What is it that you can draw on outside of what you've been doing to help you gain, uh, get over any kind of up or down, mostly the downs? Our field ha does have its ups and downs. In the past, I know professionals have talked about different seasons. Fall sometimes is a heavy season because everybody wants a Christmas present. Or after a conference that maybe you've had a exhibit booth at, you're going to get a lot of clients that way. There's different DNA when it has its um, DNA day on April 25th. There could be a, a surge four or six weeks later, whenever people are getting their tests back or the four to six weeks after Christmas, when the, those Christmas gifts of DNA kits are back in people's hands and they say, now what do I do with this? And you, the professional are out there with your website and your Facebook postings and you are known and being helpful in forums where these people also go to look for answers and you're just being helpful. And you say, you don't have to advertise yourself and say, hey, I'm a professional. That'll get you kicked off of a lot of lists. But just by your being there, I talked to a gentleman today and he says, oh, yes, I recognize your name from being in these forums that I'm in. You've answered a lot of my questions. And I don't know I'm affecting him until he tells me that. I haven't told a lot of people how they have affected me. In, uh, in these lectures and in these hallway conversations or over lunch. All right, let's talk about your biggest pivot. And that is when you decided to team up and start the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. What year was that that you first ran that program? Well, I, I'd like to start at the beginning, which is really IGHR, the Institute of Genealogical Historic Research, okay. which... Uh, has been in existence over 50 years. And I've been an instructor down there since 2007, I believe. So you were it, the genealogy as a profession course coordinator for IGHR. Yes. Yes, the genealogy. When my children were in high school, I told my husband that I needed, not wanted, but needed education on how to write. I wanted to write a book on how to do cemetery research, because I had been doing that as a volunteer thing for my local society. We published three cemetery books, and I was a part of that committee. So I wanted to uh, write uh, how to do that. And so I said, I need to go to IGHR. Helen Leary is doing the writing course there. I need to do that. So we figured out how to handle the, all the children's schedules so I could be gone for uh, a week. And I went down and learned all that. But the funny story is I never did publish that book. The following year, she also taught the genealogy as a profession course. And I went the following year to do that course. So so what I'm hearing is you quickly got your husband on board with you going away for a week every year. <laughs> <laughs> God bless my husband. He's been very supportive over the years, not just financially, but emotionally, and very supportive of my uh, career in volunteerism as well as um, at my education. Yes. And uh, that's one thing I do find uh, as a segue, as a sidebar here, is if you don't have your home support, the mentees I had picked out with potential, the ones who fell away were the ones that didn't have that home support. So they just couldn't continue on in the genealogy field uh, without that. 
but yes, my husband was supportive. I went back the following year for uh, Helen's genealogy as a profession. And then two weeks later, she had her stroke. So came back the year after that to teach the writing because she would uh, do every other year. And it was during that uh, year, I believe, to my memory, that she asked me to take over the genealogy as profession course for her. And of course, Tom Jones inherited the writing support, the genealogy as a profession course, which was not due for two more years. So because she was doing them every other year, and that was the timetable then. So my first time would have been, I think it was 2007. So it was 2000. Five, I think was her last time doing genealogy as a profession and when she asked me. And so from that, being involved in IGHR, I kept going down there with my good friend Debbie Deal and we roomed together and we enjoyed the camaraderie, the networking, uh, gained a lot of friends, got to know a bigger group of people. And I come back every year and I say, we need a Samford because it was at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama at the time. So everybody called it Samford. We need a Samford of the North, I kept saying. We need a Samford of the North. So I would pitch it every now and then to the Ohio Genealogy Society. Ohio Genealogy Society was is one of the strongest state societies we have in the country. Uh, at the time, they had like 6,000 members. Uh, they have had their annual conferences uh, for over 50 years. They have always been my college of knowledge. I sit 30 miles from the Ohio line, and so I feel very much a part of the Ohio Genealogy Society and am a lifetime member. And my family's been, my mother's family grew up there. They've been there since uh, early 1800s, uh, 1806, I think. Anyway, always been felt a part of Ohio, and I kept pitching to them, hey, you, sh you should do this institute so we can have it up here in the north. And they didn't see the vision. They built a library literally in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> Not to say anything about that, but they didn't have the infrastructure to support an institute that you need. You need an airport that's easy to get to. You need classroom space, et cetera. You always need the, the um, champion. You need a champion to champion an idea. That's why giving ideas to people really doesn't work. Or when you're in a committee and you come up with an idea, they say, well, then why don't you do it? That's just kind of the nature of humans is that uh, if you're going to come up with the idea, you need to be ready to champion it as well. Again, looking 10 years later, I've been talking to Ohio and off and on, whatever. But it was my local society, the North Hills Genealogists, when we decided to start doing conferences, when we started to branch out into our own community, that's when I found LaRoche College at the time, now university. LaRoche uh, is uh, about seven miles from me. And when I learned that they had a dormitory and classroom space available in the summer, I started thinking, wow, maybe we could do this if we because here's a good place. So I went to some of my mentors, uh, Tom Jones being one, and I said, do you see any reason why we couldn't do this? And he uh, pointed me to a few people to talk to about marketing and how other efforts that had failed and why they failed, uh, that I should learn about those efforts. What are some of the reasons that other efforts have failed? Not enough time devoted to the marketing. Okay. That's, the, you know, if you don't get the word out there, it's not going to happen. So I did all that investigation. That was uh, January of 2011. I remember sitting at JB's Diner in Salt Lake City with Tom and discussing this. And he pointed me, as I said, to others. And I investigated it. And it took about 18 months to put together when we did our first week in July of 2012 with four classes, which included Tom Jones, Paula Stewart Warren, uh, John Humphrey, who died two weeks after that first grip, and uh, Josh Taylor. They were our four course coordinators, and we had about 60 people. And we deemed it a success because they all enjoyed it. The feedback was great. Uh, they wanted to do it again, and we have grown to this coming summer at La Roche. We would have had, well, we have the three scheduled weeks. We have... Originally, it was just one week, right? Just one week. And so now you're up to three weeks. It depends on the calendar. Okay. We, yeah, we do have three weeks this year, and we still will. 
up to now we've had uh, over 440 uh, registrants for those three weeks. So it has grown a little bit. And we are very happy to be able to provide that kind of community involvement that uh, people come back year after year. And the ability to accelerate your education that you don't have to wait a whole year. In the old model of IGHR, you still have to wait a year for the next course. Here, you could, again, accelerate that um, education a little bit, or if there's a couple of topics, maybe you're German and you're Irish, and those are in different weeks, you can take both courses and, you know, succeed in getting better educated. So what kind of personal growth have you gotten out of now becoming a director of a genealogical institute? What did you learn from this? How to be an event manager, which has nothing to do with genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie and I were kind of born to do this uh, as far as what we say is we're throwing a large party for 400 of our best friends. Come on and join us. And we're going to provide you on the LaRoche campus. We can provide you housing. We can provide you meals and we can provide you entertainment in the form of this education. It's summer camp for genealogists, which somebody said, well, you shouldn't bill yourself that you should be more serious but it's that feeling you get of delight, of being with your peeps for a week, forgetting the world behind you, not being interrupted by your day-to-day -day life, devoting the time to genealogy, getting to know the people in your class, getting to know uh, the people in the other classes. Uh, we're the only ones uh, with a cafeteria anymore. That was always the hallmark of IGHR in Birmingham at Sanford University was Everybody gathered together in, in the cafeteria, all the dorm students. And we do that at La Roche, where you can sit down next to Tom Jones or Judy Russell or Blaine Bettinger and have a conver normal conversation. These are They have to eat, too. I learned long ago, talking about the revered ones in our field, that as soon as you can take them off the pedestal that you have placed them on, these are real people. They have needs, they have abilities, they have all the things that humans have. So if you can sit and have just a normal conversation with any of these uh, wonderful teachers that we have in our field and make yourself available to them, you, you can learn a lot just by sitting there and uh, eating lunch with them. I'm guessing you and Debbie had different strengths and that you've divvied up the workload between you two based on those strengths? Uh, yes. Yes, we have. She's um, more of a behind the scenes support and she's in charge of the snacks, for example, and the syllabus material. She has a commercial printer in her house. So her family business is farming. She's always been the business manager of, uh, of the farm. And so those are some of her strengths. She has a great sense of financial abilities, et cetera. And I brought uh, the skills of the computer with me from you know, my earlier days. And so that's why some people think or see me more often because I am online with, uh, I developed the website. I taught myself how to do WordPress back in 2011. I do this, uh, that kind of stuff. So yeah, we work well together. All right, Elisa, I think it is now time to enter the lightning round. Are you familiar with the lightning round? Yes. I even wrote down some answers. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, let's get started then. What was one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? I wasn't afraid of anything. And maybe that was a problem. I really don't remember being afraid of anything because I just did it. I just went ahead and never looked back. Well, that's great. Uh, what is the best advice you've ever received from someone else? Oh, the best advice I've ever received. Elizabeth Schoen Mills in 2007. And I have this quote sitting here right by my computer. It says, create a demand, then supply it. Ooh. Wow. That was the best advice okay. I've ever seen. All right. Great. Boy, we could do a whole episode just on that one topic. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? I would say education. Uh, do your education plan. Picture where you want to be and then assess where you are now to know what your knowledge gaps are. And we all have them, no matter how well educated. 
and then um, make a plan how to fill those knowledge gaps to get you to where you want to be. Great. Like, it. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Oh, can I have two? Yes. Yes, you may. <laughs> Because Jenny, I'll just love books, so go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my children look at my office and say, what are we going to do with all this? Only a Few Bones by John Coletta. I have admired that book and read it and reread it, not because you can read it on so many levels. So, Elisa, what's the second book? Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. If you're a transitional genealogist or a professional and you want to know about marketing, it describes the mavens and the influencers and how to reach them and how they interact with each other in society. And it'll make you think about how you can tap into these naturally occurring people who can pass along the word word of mouth things about your business. And that's what you want. That's the best advertising is word of mouth. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. We are all on this earth to teach, to learn, and to love. And in our genealogy arena, I want you to think about how you will do that. How will you teach? And it doesn't mean formal. How will you learn? That could be just listening to someone. How will you love? And that's how we show our appreciation for the other humans in our spheres. So that's what I would part leave you with. And to get a hold of me, I have uh, my website, powellgenealogy.com. Email is always best for me, elisa at powellgenealogy.com. Yeah, if you want to look at gripit.org, uh, I'd appreciate that too. G-R-I-P-I-T-T dot O-R-G. Elisa Scalise Powell, thank you so much for being on the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Thank you, Marion. We learn so much when we have the opportunity to hear from someone like Elisa, who has been a genealogy professional for so long and has experienced the changes and growth in the industry. We learned today that we don't always know what we don't know and that we need to keep striving to fill in the gaps in our education. We learned about the right-as-you-go method and to rely on the BCG Genealogy Standards book as our guide. And we learned about keeping our eyes open to new ideas that can help us pivot and grow our business to fulfill a need, just the way Elisa did by creating GRIP. For news this week, if you want to connect with me, join me on Facebook in the TGP Action Group. You can comment, share your expertise, and ask questions. Search for the TGP Action Group on Facebook or find the URL in the show notes. If you're not on Facebook, follow The Genealogy Professional on LinkedIn. You can get new episode notices there. Go to LinkedIn and search for The Genealogy Professional and hit the follow button. And of course, don't forget that you can now find The Genealogy Professional podcast on Spotify and YouTube. Your action item today comes straight from Elisa. Create an education plan. Picture where you want to be and assess where you are now and then fill in the gaps. No matter what your niche is in genealogy, this is a good exercise to do. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media. Copyright 2020. Executive Producer, Marion Pierre-Louis. Creative Producer, George Edwards. Technical Director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.